Hi, welcome to Cypher 2025. I have with me Krishna Grandi, senior advocate who practices at the Supreme Court and the High Court. Uh, thank you, Krishna, for taking the time to speak to us. Uh, thank you for having me. Firstly, wonderful session. I got to know a lot about the laws and rules governing AI, etc. But my first question is, the current laws that are in place, uh, does it take care of all the nuances of AI? Like even, for example, the current DPDP Act. Yeah. Uh, do you think it kind of uh, covers every kind of uh, question or doubt that a person may have is covered under that? It's a very good question. The answer is going to be slightly long. Um, <laughs> so if you think about regulation laws and how do you regulate something as vast as AI, primarily the types of ways in which you can do this, I would say are two different ways. You know, One is you can take all of the use cases of AI and try to start regulating each of those use cases. As you can imagine, there are probably a billion different ways in which you can use AI and it becomes very difficult to regulate use case level, use case level, you know, uh, regulations in our country. So what the European Union has done very brilliantly, I should say, is they have categorized the AI companies, products and services into four categories, you know, to put it very simply, um, low risk, minimal risk, hmm. high risk and unacceptable risk. So rather than get into the individual nuances of the use cases and trying to understand the products and services at a use case level, yeah. uh, they've taken one level of abstraction upwards and said, let's not worry about the use cases, let's focus on the output. And if the output poses minimal risk, medium risk, high risk or unacceptable risk, then we'll have different sets of regulations regulating these entities. As far as India is concerned, we don't have an AI law yet. So there is no equivalent of the EU, uh, European Union's AI Act in India. Having said that, it is a misconception to say that we are not regulated at all. Um, we have, I would, what I would like to call three different buckets of laws. One is the generic legislation or general registration. Uh, one is the subject specific legislation. And we also have industry specific regulations. Yeah. So generic and general legislations could be things like the DPDP Act, like you just talked about, the IPC, the IT Act. The subject specific legislations are depending on the subject matter of what it is that you're putting out into the world. Uh, if you're a banking app, you could be regulated by the, uh, sorry, th these are regulatory uh, mechanisms. If you're a banking app, you could be regulated by the RBI. Uh, if you're into finance, you could be regulated by SEBI. If you're into insurance, you could be regulated by IRDAI. There's also subject specific legislations like Consumer Protection Act or the Competition Act, depending on what your AI product or service is doing. So the, the, the long answer to your short question is yes, it may not be sufficient per se. It may not cover overarchingly everything that AI poses as questions, but it is sufficient in a manner to speak that it covers most of the generic situations that we have in our country. Mm. One of the things, for example, that is missed out in the DPDP Act is the algorithmic explainability. Now the EU app forces your explainability mechanism. So the app has to come out and say, this is how my algorithm is taking the data and this is how the algorithm is pushing out data. Mm -hmm. That level of granularity is not available in the DPDP Act, clearly because DPDP Act wasn't meant to be an AI app. Mm -hmm. It was only meant for data and privacy. Uh, so once I think an overarching scheme of laws comes into play in India, all of these balanced out items I think will all be covered in that. Got yeah. And I've always had this question, now say when you're making something new, like say an AI law yeah. or an act in India, yeah. do we consult the folks from these tech companies who would probably know the little nuances of where your data can go, how it can be misused? Yeah. Or is it more of law made by people who really don't know what exactly happens on the ground? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's made by people who don't know exactly what goes on the ground. We do have a public consultation system. Okay. Uh, so for example, when India flirted with the idea of having a Digital India Act, which was supposed to be the act that had an overarching, uh, you know, legislative framework on AI and everything else, and also to an extent, replacing the Information Technology Act, a lot of public consultations were done. Okay. And by public consultations, what they mean is the industry consultations people from the industry, both the large intermediary providers like the Metas of the world and Googles of the world were obviously involved, but also the smaller scale players and the medium scale players were also involved. 
but ultimately once all of the public comment and consumption is happening happens and uh, it is put before the uh, executive in our country yes at that point the decisions are made by our executive then which is then passed on to the legislature so there you cannot you cannot remove that part of the process but uh, the answer to your question is yes public consultation is absolutely done okay. even from the ai perspective we have the india ai mission uh, which uh, is putting out a lot of public consultations as we speak uh, there is a massive conference that's coming out uh, that's being hosted by India AI Mission in February of next year. Oh. And prior to that, uh, huge public consultation rounds are happening also. So it's all about being in the know. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as the tech companies or the end consumers are aware that these things are happening, they're able to subscribe to it and be a part of the uh, public consultation. Good. Yeah. And uh, with the way AI developments are happening now, and with the kind of AI generated image, videos are created, uh, do you see a lot of, say, AI related cases or crimes are just going to spike? Yeah. As in, they're just going to be used in ways we probably can't anticipate at the moment. So yeah. how do we work through that? I think, I think that is where uh, we need a comprehensive law. You're absolutely right. Uh, the uh, the AI produced content is creating a humongous task even for the courts, especially mm -hmm. with deep fakes. Mm -hmm. um, evidence, our evidence laws are not equipped to deal with something like a deep fake generated image or a deep fake generated audio. Uh, earlier laws were equipped for the paper based evidence, evidential procedures. Maybe we've come far enough with the IT Act and the Evidence Act amendments. To, to come in touch with the WhatsApp electronic evidence age. But beyond that, our laws have not evolved and it is becoming extremely difficult. That is where, for example, if you just take a, a, a deep fake as an example, if we have a regulation that makes it mandatory for the producers of these images, uh, for instance, to watermark that image as a deep fake image or have some code behind the scenes which we will then be able to extract out to understand what is an AI generated image versus reality. Those sorts of things will help uh, in, in the justice delivery process as well. So yes, we haven't caught up yet. And I think it will it'll take some time before we catch up, but it is posing a huge, uh, huge challenges for the judiciary now. Got it. Yeah. And, and like you said, the watermark thing, I mean, though big tech companies may comply to it, but you'll always have some companies say, yes. Some Chinese AI model, which enables you to create these without any of Yes. So that will pose it. And that will become the difficulty. One of yeah. the questions that uh, people ask all the time is, how do you know what regulations to comply? And uh, the simple answer is, wherever your users are, that is where you need to comply. Mm. So it doesn't matter if it's a Chinese software or any other software, for example, from any other country. If that application is to be marketed and promoted in India, it has to comply with the Indian rules and regulations. The problem now is we don't have an overarching set of rules and regulations that, uh, you know, that, that regulate the AI ecosystem. Once those laws are put in place, in order for any of these out of country applications to survive in India or for our users to be able to access them, they will have to comply and there will be strict enforcement mechanisms. For example, under the DPDP Act, there will be a data protection board uh, to which you can forward complaints against any erring apps that are not complying with the data privacy and uh, regulations that are put out. So once the AI regulations come, there will be a similar board that will oversee the AI regulations and laws in our country. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that, uh, you know, the enforcement mechanism, which is the key part of any regulation, will be robust in India. Got it, Krishna. And uh, in your experience, say these cases that come up, especially AI related deep fakes, are most of the time the users, consumers not aware that such such can happen? I mean, they, are they taken aback like when such an issue happens or it's more of, you know, this can happen, but then, well, it happens, so I'm going to put a case on it. Uh, so that's a good question. What happens is consumers uh, in, in my limited view are allowing things to happen until something goes wrong. Right. So the usage, for example, of phishing scams, mm -hmm. uh, almost every second person is falling into it. And almost every second person also knows that these are happening, but they continue to do it. Uh, and one, uh, you know, tech uh, lawyer had put it very nicely. They said, 
you fall into scams only for two reasons. It's either greed or need, right? So as long as there is a need, consumers are looking to put aside some of, you know, their own knowledge of what is happening around them in terms of these scams and are willing to engage with these scamsters. Sometimes maybe for greed because they want to make a quick buck or there is a quick uh, get quick rich scheme that is being promoted to them, etc. As long as those two things are there, I think this will continue to happen. Uh, but it's not for a lack of awareness. There is hundreds of awareness campaigns being conducted. I, for example, uh, am, I'm working with uh, law enforcement agencies in the state of Telangana. And we are putting out a number of, uh, uh, you know, awareness campaigns for the public to understand and know the various phishing schemes or social engineering scams that are happening in our country. People are aware, but the need or greed, I think, is what's allowing them to continue to engage with it. Mm -hmm. As long as we're able to make them aware uh, that, you know, the need or greed never really justifies what you lose in the process, I think that is where there will be a stop. Got it. To these scams. Got it, Krishna. And uh, in terms of uh, submissible in the court, the evidence, uh, like for example, there was this case in the US where uh, they created the whole crime scene using virtual reality and the judge had to wear those goggles to kind of see. Is India also that progress? I mean, are we there yet? Do we use these uh, evidences? I mean, can they be used in court firstly? Electronic evidence currently is admissible in okay. court. That is the theoretical answer. Okay. Uh, the practical answer is that the, the number of hoops that a lawyer may have to jump in order to convince uh, the honorable courts mm. that what they are submitting passes the muster of the evidentiary standard let out, uh, put out in the law, I think is, it's, it's a lot more different practically. Mm -hmm. So practically speaking, it becomes a lot more difficult to introduce a 3D virtual uh, imagery as an evidence to a judge. Yeah. Uh, but theoretically, yes, electronic evidence is permissible in India. Okay, got it, got it. So just to move on from that, uh, just come to the end of the yeah. interview. So we're talking a lot about regulations, laws, but isn't there always a case of we are kind of, uh, what do you say, putting a stop cap on the innovation that's happening? Like you had mentioned that yeah. innovation and regulation. So, uh, so what is the right way? If we over-regulate, we are also not allowing a lot of innovation to happen with, say, tech companies and models. So what is the best way that you feel uh, can be used? I, with, with everything in life, moderation is the key. Uh, I think the uh, European Union's AI Act is a good model. Uh, they have tried, again, like I said, not to stick with the use case scenario-based regulation, which would have actually stifled innovation. Mm -hmm. and gone to the categorization of risk categories. And as long as companies are aware which category they fall into, they are mm -hmm. able to pre-prepare themselves uh, for the uh, regulations accordingly. So even in the EU, unless you your application falls under the unacceptable risk category, for example, social scoring websites, uh, every every other app, no matter which of the other three buckets you fall into, there is no prohibition per se of you being able to develop your product or service and to be able to market it in the European Union. All they are saying is if you fall in the higher risk categories of buckets, please comply with some additional requirements. It could be an audit requirement, it could be a compliance or a reporting requirement. Yeah. That's okay. But just comply with some additional requirements so that you are still able to benefit from the market access and entry. So I think moderation is the key as long as you are able to prepare companies and make it abundantly clear what it is that they have to comply with. I think most of the companies, at least that I advise and work with, they are comfortable making those adjustments internally. All right. Yeah. Clarity is the key. Perfect. So we, we are to the end of the, I mean, I did say that was the last yeah. question, but I just had one. What has been one of the craziest AI related cases that you have encountered? Anything that you could share? Uh, nothing as such. I think we <laughs> okay. haven't really started. Uh, we have advised clients on the criminal side of things yeah. where AI generated deep fake imagery was used. I advise a lot of media clients and entertainment clients we have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so when, when uh, AI was used to create uh, offensive imagery and deep fake imagery, we were able to advise the clients on what actions to take, mm -hmm. what sort of complaints to draft for the police and uh, what sort of actions we can take through the judicial system. Yeah. And we were able to get a stop put on it through IP address blocking. 
Uh, we've done that for piracy as well, for movie piracy. But uh, that is in so far as what we've been able to do so far. As far as any civil cases are concerned, like, you know, class action lawsuits filed by authors, etc., that really hasn't started in India yet. Okay. And uh, if it does, we are hoping to be a part of it and uh, create some good jurisprudence here in India. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Krishna. Thank you for your opportunity.